Hosanna to the Son of David, the King of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Dear brothers and sisters, since the beginning of Lent until now, we have prepared our hearts by penance and charitable works. Today we gather together to herald with the whole church the beginning of the celebration of our Lord's Paschal Mystery, that is to say of the Passion and Resurrection, for it was to accomplish this mystery that he, that he entered his own city of Jerusalem there with all faith and devotion, let us commemorate the Lord's entry into the city for our salvation, following in his footsteps, so that being made by his grace partakers of the cross, we may have a share also in the resurrection of his life. And let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, sanctify these branches with your blessings that we who follow Christ the King in exultation may reach the eternal Jerusalem through him who lives and reigns forever and ever. be with you and with your spirit a reading from the holy gospel according to mark glory to you lord when jesus and his disciples drew near to jerusalem to bethpage and bethany at the mount of olives he sent two of his disciples and said to them go into the village opposite you and immediately upon entering it you will find a colt tethered which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone should say to you, why are you doing this? Reply, the master has need of it and will send it back here at once. So they went off and found a colt tethered at the gate outside on the street and they untied it. Some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They answered them just as Jesus had told them to, and they permitted them to do it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and put their cloaks over it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. Those preceding him as well as those following kept crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is to come. Hosanna in the highest. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Children, make love. 
Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who is an example of humility for the human race to follow, caused our Savior to take flesh and submit to the cross. Graciously grant that we may heed his lesson of patient suffering and so merit a share in his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord God has given me a well-trained tongue that I might know how to speak to the weary, a word that will rouse them. Morning after morning, he opens my ear that I may hear, and I have not rebelled, have not turned back. I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who plucked my beard. My face I did not shield from buffets and spitting. The Lord God is my help, therefore I am not disgraced. I have set my my face like flint, knowing that I shall not be put to shame. The word of the Lord. Why 
Why have you abandoned me? A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard God equal did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Coming in human likeness and found human in appearance, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. One of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver, and from that time on he looked for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples approached Jesus and said, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time draws near in your house. I shall celebrate the Passover with my disciples. The disciples then did as Jesus had ordered, and preparing the Passover. When that was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Deeply distressed at this, they began to say to him one after another, Surely it is not I, Lord. He said in reply, He who has dipped his hand into the dish with me is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes, as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had never been born. Then Judas, his betrayer, said in reply, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. He answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread said the blessing, broke it, and giving it to his disciples, said, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, 
which will be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, from now on I shall not drink this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it with you new in the kingdom of my Father. Then, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, This night all of you will have your faith in me shaken, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be dispersed. But after I have been raised up, I shall go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him in reply, Though all may have their faith in you shaken, mine will never be. Jesus said to him, Amen, I say to you, this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I should have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples spoke likewise. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to feel sorrow and distress. Then he said to them, My soul is sorrowful even to death. Remain here and keep watch with me. He advanced a little and fell prostrate in prayer, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. When he returned to his disciples, he found them asleep. He said to Peter, So you could not keep watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Withdrawing a second time, he prayed again. My father, if it is not possible that this cup pass without my drinking it, your will be done. Then he returned once more and found them asleep, for they could not keep their eyes open. He left them and withdrew again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing again. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand when the Son of Man is to be handed over to sinners. Get up, let us go. Look, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs, who had come from the chief priests and the elders of the people. His betrayer had arranged a sign with them, saying, The man I shall kiss is the one. Arrest him. Immediately, he went over to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus answered him, Friend, do what you have come for. Then, stepping forward, they laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. And behold, one of those who accompanied Jesus put his hand to his sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its sheath, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot call upon my Father, and he will not provide me at this moment with more than twelve legions of angels? But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say that it must come to pass in this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as, a, as against a robber with swords and clubs to seize me? Day after day I sat teaching in the temple area, yet you did not arrest me. But all this has come to pass that the writings of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders were assembled. Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the high priest's courtyard, 
and going inside, he sat down with the servants to see the outcome. The chief priests and the entire Sanhedrin kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus in order to put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward who stated, This man said, I can destroy the temple of God and within three days rebuild it. The high priest rose and addressed him. Have you no answer? What are these men testifying against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I order you to tell us under oath before the living God whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him in reply, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. What further need have we of witnesses? You have now heard the blasphemy. What is your opinion? They said in reply, He deserves to die. Then they spat in his face and struck him, while some slapped him, saying, Prophesy for us, Christ. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. One of the maids came over and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it in front of everyone, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. As he went out to the gate, Another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This man was with Jesus the Nazarene. Again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. A little later, the bystanders came over and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them. Even your speech gives you away. At that, he began to curse and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately a cock crowed. Then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. He went out and began to weep bitterly. When it was morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that Jesus had been condemned, deeply regretted what he had done. He returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? Look to it yourself. Flinging the money into the temple, he departed, and went off and hanged himself. The chief priest gathered up the money, but said, It is not lawful to deposit this in the temple treasury, for it is the price of blood. After a consultation, they used it to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why that field, even today, is called the field of blood. Then was fulfilled what had been said through Jeremiah the prophet. And they took the 30 silver pieces of silver, the value of a man with a price on his head, a price set by some of the Israelites. And they paid it out for the potter's field, just as the Lord had commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor and he questioned him. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus you, said, You say so. And when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they are testifying against you? But he did not answer him one word, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now on the occasion of the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the crowd one prisoner whom they wished. 
and at that time they had a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. So when they had assembled, Pilate said to them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had handed him over. While he was still seated on the bench, his wife sent him a message. Have nothing to do with that righteous man. I have I suffered much in a dream today because of him. The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas, but to destroy Jesus. The governor said to them in reply, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They answered, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. But he said, Why? What evil has he done? They only shouted the louder, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he was not succeeding at all, but that a riot was breaking out instead, he took water and washed his hands in the sight of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. Look to it yourselves. And the whole people said in reply, His blood be upon us and upon our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But after he had Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus inside the praetorium and gathered the whole court around him. They stripped him of his clothes and threw his scarlet military cloak around him. Weaving a crown out of thorns, they placed it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat upon him and took the reed and kept striking him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him off to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a Cyrenian named Simon. This man they pressed into service to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave Jesus wine to drink with gall. But when he had tasted it, he refused to drink. After they had crucified him, they divided his garments by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And they placed over his head the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and the other on his left. Those passing by reviled him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him and said, he saved others. He cannot save himself. So he is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. The revolutionaries who were crucified with him also kept abusing him in the same way. From noon onward, Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard this said, This one is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran to get a sponge. He soaked it in wine and putting it on a reed, gave it to him to drink. But the rest said, Wait, let us see if Elijah comes to save him. But Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, 
and gave up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked, rocks were split, tombs were opened, and the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming forth from their tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. The centurion and the men with him who were keeping watch over Jesus, feared greatly when they saw the earthquake and all that was happening. And they said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was himself a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be handed over. Taking the body, Joseph wrapped it in clean linen and laid it in his new tomb that he had hewn in the rock. Then he rolled a huge stone across the entrance to the tomb and departed. But Mary Magdalene and the other Mary remained there, sitting there, facing the tomb. The next day, the one following the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that this impostor, while still alive, said, After three days I will be raised up. Give orders, then, that the grave be secured until the third day, lest his disciples come and steal him and say to the people, He has been raised from the dead. This last imposture would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, The guard is yours. Go, secure it as best you can. So they went and secured the tomb by fixing a seal to the stone and setting the guard. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to, you, to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Well, greetings to all who are joining us in prayer this morning. I wish to give a special welcome to the non-Catholics who are with us this morning. Thank you for honoring us with your presence and uniting with us in prayer. It is indeed a surreal experience to be here in this cathedral that is essentially empty. And it is... Uh, one of those many experiences that we've all been having these days. This Palm Sunday liturgy moves at warp speed as we begin by commemorating our Lord's triumphant entry into Jerusalem to, and then very shortly we go to his passion and burial and death on the hill of Calvary outside the city. Several years ago, Father Reniero Cantalamesa gave a retreat for the bishops from Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, and Nebraska. And during the course of the retreat, Father Cantalamesa reminded us that the most important sections of the four Gospels are the Passion narratives. He noted that in the liturgical calendar, we only read the Passion narratives on Palm Sunday and Good Friday. And on both of these days, the rubrics in the sacramentary state 
After the reading of the Passion, there may be a brief homily. As a consequence, priests rarely, if at all, preach on the Passion narratives. And when they do, the liturgy only permits them a minimal amount of time to instruct their people on the most important portion, really, of all the New Testament. The Passion narratives are truly the heart of the Gospel. We should attempt to meditate upon them during the course of the year, but especially during this week, Holy Week. The Passion of St. John is always read on Good Friday. For Palm Sunday, we read the Passion from one of the three other Gospels that we follow on the Sundays throughout that particular year. This year, we're following the Gospel of Matthew. The Passion narratives do not change, but the circumstances in which we ponder them are different each year. And certainly that is dramatically the case this year. The annual change of perspective allows us to hear the Passion with fresh eyes and fresh ears, where particular aspects take on a new meaning and application to our lives. We ponder the Passion this Holy Week under the shadow of the coronavirus pandemic. Like so many experiences of the past two weeks, one has the sense, as I said at the beginning, of the surreal. It is odd to celebrate this Palm Sunday Mass without a procession and the distribution of palms. And it is odd to be in this essentially vacant cathedral. It is equally strange for you not to be assembled in your parish churches, gathered with your respective faith families, and being prevented now from receiving our Lord in the Eucharist, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Many are suffering in our nation and some in our own community with this treacherous virus and because of its super contagious nature are separated from family and loved ones when the support of others is really most needed and desired. According to yesterday's statistics, there are almost 1.2 million confirmed cases worldwide, more than 310,000 in the United States and 698 in Kansas with more than 64,000 deaths throughout the world, 8,400 in the U.S. and 21 in Kansas. In addition to these sobering coronavirus numbers of sick, suffering, and deaths, our entire economy has been shut down, creating tremendous insecurity and anxiety for individuals and employers. Skyrocketing unemployment numbers and the inability for anyone to give a time certain when our economy will reopen augments worry and fear. We are going through a time of social isolation unlike any other, where love for others and concern for the common good impede us from being physically present to those who are suffering most acutely. The effects of the pandemic impact our society that at the current moment was already experiencing what many called ep epidemics of loneliness, depression, and even suicide. How is God speaking to Christians as we observe this most sacred week of the entire year? How can pondering the events of 2,000 years ago that gave us life in Jesus Christ speak and impact our minds and hearts in a time unlike anything that any of us have experienced previously. The passion of Jesus, just from a purely literary point of view, is truly the greatest story ever told. The passion has so many fascinating characters that are relevant to the universal human experience. It is a story of deep friendships, tremendous anxiety, betrayal, abandonment, envy, injustice, deception, cruelty, cowardice, mob mania, despair, contrition, sorrow, irony, and the ultimate example in the crucified one of fidelity, 
mercy, and love. These narratives are not fiction. One can visit the very sites where the events we read about today transpired. Christians for 2,000 years have kept the memory of the actual places where Jesus agonized, where he was betrayed, where he was tried, scourged, suffered, and died. You can walk the Via Dolorosa, the path of sorrow that Jesus trod, from Pilate's Praetorium to, the, to Calvary, the place of the skull. And just this past October, with about a hundred pilgrims, I was privileged to be in these places, to celebrate Mass at these very places. Christianity is premised on a God of revelation. Our faith is not in a God that we might imagine or simply make up. God reveals himself to us in a way that is startling and surprising. St. Bernard of Clairvaux observed that our faith is in a God who in his divinity cannot suffer, but who can choose to suffer with us. Pope Emeritus Benedict describes this truth by writing, Man is worth so much to God that he himself became a man in order to suffer with man in a, an utterly real way, in flesh and blood, as is revealed to us in the account of Jesus' passion. This means that in all human suffering, we are joined by the one who experiences and carries that suffering with us. Hence, consolation is present in all suffering, the consolation of God's compassionate love. And so the star of hope rises, unquote. St. Paul reminded us today in our second reading, Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness and founded human appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. During the Passion, Jesus goes through a wide range of human emotions. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asked his Father to remove this cup of suffering, sweating drops of blood as he contemplates what is about to unfold. However, in the end, Jesus conforms his will perfectly to his Heavenly Father, seeking, not my will, but thine be done. The responsorial psalm for, for today's liturgy holds the key to understanding the meaning of the words that, of Jesus from the cross. Jesus is actually reciting the first line of the Psalm 22. Observant Jews would understand this reference. Psalm 22 is one of the many prophecies in the Jewish scriptures that describes exactly the experience of Jesus where Jesus is now crying from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is actually calling out Psalm 22, reciting its first line. And the verses of the psalm are echoes of what is happening to Jesus in real time before the eyes of the historical witnesses to the Passion events. The psalmist describes the mocking, the wagging of heads, the taunting, the piercing of his hands and feet, the dividing of his garments by the casting of lots. However, Psalm 22 does not end in despair over the psalmist's profound experience of some suffering, but rather is a great affirmation of faith. The psalmist proclaims, I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise him. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, give glory to him. Throughout the Passion narrative, Jesus is accused of claiming to be a king. Our Lord never denies this charge, but he is a king like unlike any other king. Pilate even has the title King of the Jews placed above him on the cross. He is mocked by the Roman soldiers as they crown him with thorns and dress him in royal robes while they mockingly kneel before him and taunt him and spit upon him. 
One of the great ironies of the narrative, once Jesus has expired and the earth quakes, it is the Roman centurion and soldiers who make the sincerest profession of faith. Truly, this was the Son of God. So as we begin this Holy Week journey in the unusual environment of a pandemic, the liturgies of this week invite us to open our hearts anew to the beauty and the power of our Christian faith. The Passion narratives reveal one of the most profound blessings of our Christian faith that can provide meaning to suffering and sure and certain hope, even in the face of death. Jesus does not remove suffering from his disciples. In fact, he warns us if we follow him, we will indeed carry the cross as well. We must follow him all the way to Calvary. Jesus understands if our faith is shaken and even appears to buckle at moments of adversity. After all, this is precisely what happened to the apostles and most of the disciples during the Passion. Yet he has shown us the way that our suffering can become the opportunity for us not only to love most purely, but become the instrument to draw forth love from others. It is in the midst of our own experience of the cross that we can provide the most powerful witness to the priceless gift of our friendship with Jesus. It is from our own Calvaries that we can proclaim a hope and evidence of joy that is not dependent on the external circumstances of our lives, but comes from our knowledge of who we are, beloved daughters and sons of our Heavenly Father and sisters and brothers of Jesus Christ, that viruses, diseases, suffering, and even death itself cannot steal from us. There are heroes besides Jesus in the Passion narrative, and they are the women who come and are with Jesus even on Calvary, even when the apostles, save for John, have abandoned him. And it's these women that we see the example of how we are to respond to the suffering of others, to accompany them. And we are reminded of them by the doctors, the nurses, the emergency responders, our police and fire who care for people during this emergency and offer a symbol of heroism. And we see this in the countless acts of generosity and love that many are extending to others at this time, especially to those that are isolated and alone. These are ways in which we can glorify this God who's loved us in such an amazing and remarkable way. I conclude this homily by quoting St. Andrew of Crete from a reading that's found in the Office of Readings that all clergy pray on this day. In his humility, Christ entered the dark regions of our fallen world, and he is glad that he became so humble for our sake, glad that he came and lived among us and shared in our nature in order to raise us up again to himself. And even though we are told that he is now ascended above the highest heaven, the proof surely of his power and Godhead, his love for man will never rest until he has raised our earth, he has raised our earthbound nature from glory to glory and made it one with his own in heaven. So let us spread before his feet, not garments of soulless olive branches, which delight the eye for a few hours and then wither, but ourselves clothed in his grace, or rather completely clothed in him. We who have been baptized in Christ must ourselves be the garments that we spread before him. Now that the crimson stains of our sins have been washed away in the saving waters of baptism, and we have become white as pure wool, let us present the conqueror of death, not with mere branches of palm, but the, with the real rewards of his victory. 
Let our souls take the place of the welcoming branches as we join today in the children's holy song. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Blessed be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. Having heard this beautiful word of God, the Passion Narratives, let us now proclaim our faith as we, pro as we say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, and who is spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now with grateful hearts for God who has so loved us, who sent his Son into the world, who gave his life for us, let us approach our Heavenly Father now with those needs that are in our hearts. For the church, as it suffers to proclaim God's message, we pray to the Lord, Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For families who daily undergo the challenge to love, even when it hurts, we pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are victims of the cross, inflicted through misunderstanding, prejudice, and or persecution, we pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For the poor and suffering whom we ignore because we are afraid or are frustrated, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For strength, courage, and perseverance in faith for all of our brothers and sisters in the Archdiocese of Kansas City in Kansas, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That we might all have a good holy week, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For healing for all those who are sick or suffering in any way, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for all of our family and friends who have died, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we are in awe of your amazing love revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us as we try to follow him in the way of unconditional love. Help us to be his voice, his hands, his arms in bringing this love to the world today. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Pray, my sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and the glory of his name, for our good and the good of all of this holy church. Through the passion of our only begotten Son, O Lord, may our reconciliation with you be near at hand, so that though we do not merit it by our own deeds, Yet by this sacrifice made once for all, we may feel already the effects of your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For though innocent, he suffered willingly for sinners and accepted unjust condemnation to save the guilty. His death has washed away our sins, and his resurrection has purchased our justification. And so with all the angels, we praise you as in joyful celebration we acclaim. Holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, 
the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, St. Peter, St. John Vianney, St. Rose Philippine Duchenne, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, and me, your unworthy servant, James Patrick, our Archbishop Emeritus, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you, and your compassionate, merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. And through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the, For the kingdom, kingdom and the power, and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit.
Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
For those who are unable to receive Jesus sacramentally, we offer this act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are in the blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. As though you have already come, I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. Nourished with these sacred gifts, we humbly beseech you, O Lord, that just as through the death of your Son you have brought us to hope for what we believe, so by his resurrection you may lead us to where you call, through Christ our Lord. Well, thank you again for joining us in this way. Um, each year I invite uh, all the members of the Archdiocese to come to the cathedral for at least one of our, our Holy Week services. And um, this, we're glad you were able to come. We had a full cathedral in one sense today with all of you viewing this. And I'm grateful to all those that assisted with the liturgy, our organists and cantor, our lectors, our deacon, all that assisted and those with the technology that helped make this possible. So thank you very much for your assistance today in, in sharing this Mass with so many. And we hope that you have a, a beautiful and blessed Palm Sunday. I don't know if our camera crew was able to um, look at some of the beauty of this cathedral, particularly its windows are, are spectacular. So uh, hopefully you can join us for the other liturgies of Holy Week as well on Holy Thursday evening. We'll be celebrating from here Good Friday in the afternoon at three o'clock. We'll be celebrating the Lord's Passion here. And then on the Holy Saturday night, the Easter Vigil will be celebrated here as well. And then Easter Sunday morning. So you're welcome to all of those. Tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Holy Week, I'll be celebrating live streaming Masses again for my chapel at 8.30 in the morning. So please uh, join us through Facebook. Um, uh, you can go to my Facebook page or go to our, our website at the Archdiocese. Before we uh, dismiss you and bless you, just... Um, do you know why they call a cathedral a cathedral? Uh, they, call, they call it because of this chair. The, this is the bishop's chair, and that's the cathedral is the place where the bishop's chair is located. And the chair is a symbol of the bishop's responsibility to be a teacher of the faith. And actually, no one else is to sit in the bishop's chair. Even when Pope John Paul came to St. Louis and celebrated 
in the cathedral at St. Louis. He didn't sit in the archbishop's chair because it's a, it's, it's a symbol of that special responsibility that that particular bishop has for his diocese. So um, that's a little trivia that you can impress your friends with about why cathedrals are called cathedrals today. Um, we hope you have a blessed Palm Sunday. I hope it's a great day for you and for your families. Let's continue to pray that the Lord will help us bring an end to this pandemic soon uh, so that we can return to our lives, but return in a different way, changed by this experience, where perhaps we've seen things that previously we didn't put as much importance upon, um, we see in a new light, in a new way. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Bow down for the blessing. Look, we pray, O Lord, on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ did not hesitate to be delivered into the hands of the wicked and submit to the agony of the cross, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain forever. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. Remember me.